In the South Seas, there's a cargo cult of people. During the war, they saw airplanes land with lots of good materials, and they want the same thing to happen now. So they've arranged to make things like runways, to put fires along the sides of the runways, to make a wooden hut for a man to sit in with two pieces on his head like headphones and bars of bamboo sticking out like antennas. He's the controller, and they wait for the airplanes to land. They're doing everything right, the form is perfect, it looks exactly the way it looked before. But it doesn't work. No airplanes land. So I call these things cargo cult science, because they follow all the apparent precepts and forms of scientific investigation, but they're missing something essential, because the planes don't land. In Caltech's 1974 commencement address, physicist Richard Feynman drew a comparison between pseudoscience and the practices of a cargo cult in Papua New Guinea. In essence, he said that just as those in a cargo cult go through all the superficial motions of building and maintaining an airstrip, pseudoscientists go through all the superficial motions of scientific inquiry. In both cases, something vital is missing. In one case, the planes don't land, and in another, scientific progress isn't made. Though ample effort is put forward and those involved think they're progressing toward their goal, nothing of value is accomplished. So what are they missing? Of course, those in a cargo cult lack any understanding of airport safety standards or any connection to the aviation community. Meanwhile, pseudoscience lacks the kind of painstaking rigor that science demands for its progression. Still though, it ensures that it displays all the same bells and whistles, and does this to its financial advantage. To illustrate just what I mean, allow me to take you through a few key features and practices of cargo cult science. But first, if you'd like to learn more about cargo cults, Godless Cranium is releasing a video on them very soon, so subscribe to him to catch that video once it drops. We thought it would be fun to release these videos in tandem, and watching his video might help you understand Richard Feynman's analogy a bit better. Okay, on to my first point. Fabricated terminology. Purveyors of all kinds of pseudoscience create their own official terminology, but do so in a very different way than actual scientists. Recognized terms within any given field of science are proposed and used within a peer-reviewed research article first, and then circulated within the literature further. How a newly defined term is used from there depends on the field in question. A new term may be recognized and officially defined by the APA in the field of psychology in the US, for instance. In chemistry, that's done by the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. The point is, coining a new scientific term isn't as simple as just making one up. For pseudoscientists though, coining a new term is that easy. Take the terms historical and observational science. Creationists use these to supposedly draw a distinction between different methods of scientific testing and observation. They're not outlandish sounding, they sound believable enough, but their origin leaves a lot to be desired. These terms were just devised by intelligent design proponent Dr. Charles Thaxon in the 80s in his book, The Mystery of Life's Origin. The terms were later picked up by Answers in Genesis, which is an apologetics organization. These terms have never been recognized within any field of science, but they're spoken about as if they have. Weist Rhino has a great video on this that I highly suggest that you check out. The term detox as it's often used is another example of fabricating scientific sounding terminology. Detox is a legitimate medical term. It refers to the process of removing large amounts of toxic substances like drugs, alcohol, and poisons from the body. Detoxification, as it's recognized in the medical field, refers to medical care being provided for that purpose under potentially life-threatening circumstances. It doesn't refer to cleansing oneself of small amounts of carcinogens or heavy metals. David Avocado Wolf, Josh Axe, Dr. Oz, and the like reference detoxing as if it refers to the latter, and then try to sell you juices and superfoods which will do just that. People buy into the idea that detoxing is something to be done on a regular basis to lower one's chance of disease, because that's how purveyors of pseudoscience use the term detox. That usage has no scientific basis, it's just a marketing tool. Fabricated terms like this just impede scientific progress. Where terms like this are used, the planes don't land. Reliance on hypotheses. Pseudoscientists love to explain the mechanism behind the complex phenomenon they're discussing, or whatever product they're selling. If you read up on homeopathy, for instance, you're bound to come across multiple explanations of how extreme dilution increases the potency of a substance. Some suppose that water has some type of memory, or that some vibrational energy is amplified through dilution. While not all explanations are the same, any and all explanations have something in common. They're not backed up by any research. Homeopathy's efficacy is so long debunked that any explanation of its efficacy is nonsensical. Unfortunately, explanations of how it works are enough to convince a lot of people that it does work. 
They don't realize that an explanation of the mechanism behind a phenomenon is only as valid as it is demonstrable through observation and testing of its predictions. In the actual scientific community, an explanation of a phenomenon based on an observation but not thoroughly tested is a hypothesis. Real scientists don't teach hypotheses as fact. Creationists are also notoriously good at treating hypotheses as facts, and they get bonus points for projecting their own issues and accusing those who accept evolution of doing exactly that. A great example of creationists doing this is in the case of the acceptance of hydrologic sorting as an explanation for the geologic column. Thanks to Polygia for introducing me to this, by the way. I'll let Eric Hoven explain this one to you. Dense animals, such as clams, are typically found at the bottom. Light animals, such as birds with their feathers and hollow bones, are typically found at the top. What we see all around the world in the geologic column is hydrologic sorting taking place. So Eric has made an observation that certain less dense fossils like those of birds are found in the upper layers of the geologic column. He proposed an explanation for this, which is hydrologic sorting. After that though? Indications of a? Single worldwide flood, worldwide not a bunch flood. of different floods. One flood, one, all the different layers. Worldwide. He accepts his hypothesis as fact and just moves on. No more testing, no more observation needed, it's settled. If he investigated further, he might see that fossils are not reliably sorted by their density at all. Some birds are found in the layers below some mammals, and many dense animals like clams are found in every layer since the Cambrian. Make sure and check out Polygia's in-depth video on this, by the way. Homeopaths and creationists alike love to give explanations for their observations, but they don't test them any further, making them useless. To those who are uninformed, it appears that there are two sides of the debate. Homeopaths say this, and MDs say this. Creationists say this, and evolutionists say this. Those who understand exactly whose points are valid, however, are those who ask just how and if someone's explanation has been tested and verified. Where sufficient testing hasn't been done, the planes don't land. Backing from experts. Nearly every kind of pseudoscience has someone with a high level degree backing it up in some way. That allows a lot of people who believe some form of nonsense to feel confident in their belief because it's backed up by an expert. Backing from someone with a certain degree is not evidence for an idea's validity, but I don't think it's a stretch to say that every valid scientific theory is backed up by multiple experts. Because of this, it's crucial to understand exactly when support from highly educated people actually means something. Let's take a look at intelligent design. It's definitely accepted by some people with PhDs. There's even a think tank dedicated to it called the Discovery Institute, with a research branch, the Biologic Institute. That seems compelling on the surface, but if we take a closer look into what scientific research comes out of the organization, we see that it's less than impressive. In their first four years, the Biologic Institute produced exactly two papers, neither offering support for intelligent design and both being published in non-scientific journals. There are more articles listed on their site now, but most of them either predate the Institute or weren't produced by the Institute's own faculty. It's like they're just there for show. Go check them out. I've linked their site in the description as well as to the video by Concordance, which tipped me off to all this. This further demonstrates the points made in King Crocoduck's classic video, The Truth About PhD Creationists. Neither Humphreys nor any other creationist with a PhD has ever published any article defending creationism in any respected scientific journals because creationism is not supported by science. This is the truth about creationists with PhDs. Their diplomas exist for the sole purpose of inflating the credibility of the institutions that they represent. Sometimes, however, actual accomplished experts do make claims within their field which are pseudoscientific. Take Deepak Chopra, for example. He's an accomplished medical doctor, yet he makes outlandish claims about the relationship between biology and consciousness. He bases his claims on his understanding of quantum physics, and often explains his ideas on quantum physics in order to drive home his points about biology and consciousness. Quantum healing is just uh, uh, a theory that uh I proposed many years ago, and it's just the theory that a shift in consciousness uh, creates a shift in biology. Quantum leaps, for example, are examples of discontinuity, and uh, creativity in consciousness is also an example of discontinuity, and that healing may be a biological phenomenon that uh, relies on biological creativity that at very fundamental levels it may be a discontinuous phenomenon. It's something unpredictable that happens in the proliferation of uncertainty. Those outside Deepak's niche of Vedic spiritualists tend to have a problem with this, though. The deeper point here, and this is where the whole style and content of what you're saying is so deeply unscientific, is that 
There's not, a, there's not a physicist sitting on this stage right now. Okay, I would never be tempted to lecture a room full of a thousand people at Caltech about physics. I'm not a physicist. You're not a physicist. And, and, and basically every sentence demonstrates that, that you speak on the subject. Deepak is a medical doctor. He's obviously a smart guy, but he makes certain claims within his own field and then reaches way outside of his field in order to back them up. His claims within his own field are based on his understanding of a field in which he has no formal education. Because of this, his degrees do nothing to provide any credibility for his claims. Where educated people endorse ideas but don't provide research or relevant arguments, the planes don't land. Inadequate or dogmatic schooling. What could lend a set of ideas more apparent credibility than having institutions of higher learning based around them? After all, a system of thought which is established and widespread enough to be taught in its own school must have something to it, right? Well, the way in which courses are taught and degrees awarded is what really needs to be factored into that judgment. Let's first take a look at theological schools. Not all theological schools are problematic. In fact, a great number of them are based within secular universities and provide a legitimate means of education on religious tradition and philosophy. However, there are some which are less reputable. These are schools which require an official statement of faith for admission or graduation, or which enforce rules on their campuses which are based on religious tradition. Moody Bible Institute, Pensacola Christian College, and Bob Jones University are examples of schools which do one or both of those things. Education on a subject has only to do with increasing the awareness and comprehension of factual information on a subject regardless of personal beliefs or practices of either the student or teacher. If education is compromised by personal religious beliefs or practice, what is being taught ceases to be education and becomes a propagation of dogma. Requiring any kind of religious belief or practice in a theological school is exactly that kind of compromise. It shows that school's priorities to be the observance of religious tradition first and the furthering of education second. Yet, those schools present as legitimate facilitators of useful education. Naturopathic schools also present this way. According to the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians, a licensed naturopathic physician attends a four-year graduate-level naturopathic medical school and is educated in all of the same basic sciences as an MD, but also studies holistic and non-toxic approaches to therapy with strong emphasis on disease prevention and optimizing wellness. What they fail to mention, however, is that no residency is required for naturopaths to begin practicing and making diagnoses after completing a four-year degree. MDs do not begin practicing independently as they're not considered competent to practice until after completing a residency. This fact, along with the fact that naturopathic schools still promote thoroughly debunked treatments like homeopathy, easily demonstrates that they're not up to par with actual medical schools. They make a great presentation, but the planes don't land. Cargo cult science is not to be discarded only because it dishonestly portrays itself as actual science, but also because it's dangerous. Every day, people make life decisions, even medical decisions, based on ideas that appear legitimate but lack any real scientific rigor to back them up. As a defense for yourself, learn the tells of cargo cult science, understand well what real science looks like, and be able to spot cheap imitations. That way, hopefully, every plane that you depend on will land. Thanks for watching. I've been Drew from Genetically Modified Skeptic. Remember to check out Godless Cranium's video on cargo cults once it's out. Also, go ahead and subscribe to my channel and check out my Patreon. You can also follow me on Twitter at GMSkeptic. Until next time, everyone, stay skeptical.